Welcome back from lunch. I hope you enjoyed the breakout sessions. Uh, we're going to go into our lunchtime uh, presentation by Shahid Shah. Shahid is an internationally recognized and influential health IT, healthcare IT thought leader is known as the healthcare IT guy on the internet. He is a technology strategy consultant to many federal agencies and winner of Federal Computer Week's coveted Fed 100 Award given to IT experts that have made a big impact on government. He's also architected and built multiple clinical solutions over his almost 22 year career. Please join me in welcoming Shahid Shah. Thank you. <clears throat> great. Okay, well, thanks uh, for that uh, great welcome. And my job is to entertain you for the next hour. Uh, so, and uh, you know, as part of the presentation that I'll do, I'll be asking you guys a lot of questions, uh, so please just shout it out. I mean, we would, we'd like this to be as interactive as possible. The more I can interrupt you during lunch uh, to have you say something, uh, the more useful I think the conversation will be. So my job is to really help you reimagine quality measurement. And we're, I, I love the idea of the NCQA event, uh, especially the idea of the Digital Quality Summit, is what happens with measures when we know that we are digital native and not digital immigrants. So uh, given uh, the, the idea that, uh, you know, so we, we heard the numbers this morning, 95% of all hospitals, uh, upwards at 80 plus percent of ambulatory are already digital, what could that do? So what I'd like for us to do is to think about some wacky ideas for the next hour. And uh, we have to do normal, real work after this lunch. But during lunch, I want us to think a little bit more uh, broadly, like if we're reimagining uh, based on a bottom-up uh, perspective, what would that look like? <clears throat> so big question I'd like to ask all of us is when we're looking at the next uh, couple of days is, why are we measuring quality at all? Is it for compliance? Is it for cost? Is it for process? Is it for outcomes? Is it for what? And you know, as part of the couple of workshops that I attended this morning, uh, it's really important when someone has an idea or somebody has a suggestion, just ask them, why? What's the purpose of the measure? What's the purpose of what we're doing? And sometimes just that simple question, why, uh, helps us move towards a better direction than just accepting something as a good idea or a bad idea. Because if you don't know why you're doing something, it's almost rarely a good idea. So uh, the next thing we, not, we wanna make sure is we understand, let me just ask you guys, based on these six things, I'll just ask you to just show of hands real quick, who do you think we are measuring quality for? How many of you think it's for payers and insurers? Yes, some of you. How many of you think it's for uh, health systems and uh, healthcare professionals? How about uh, regulators? Ah, lots of hands go up. <laughs> How about patients and their caregivers? All right, good. So now, if I asked now uh, how many of you thought we were successfully doing it for patients, probably a lot of those hands would go down. But at least we know why we're doing it, right? Uh, so that's uh, very, very important. So. Uh, my belief is that MU made us take our eye off the innovation ball for a little while, and now when we get a chance to revisit it uh, a little bit, uh, we can see uh, you know, the, the measures that we're looking at probably right now, uh, the reason why we're all here is many of them are just pretty crappy measures. I mean, ultimately speaking, uh, there, that doesn't mean that uh, it wasn't good work and uh, that we can't build on top of them, but we know that many of them are crappy measures today, so what do we do? So here, let's rethink, and that's what this hour is about, is reimagining what would quality look like, quality measurement look like, if we removed MU silliness and just said, okay, well, we have to do it because it's MU or because of regulators, et cetera. And what if that didn't make us take our eye off the innovation ball and people only bought EHRs because it did something for their patients or the patients as caregivers? What if that was the world that we were in? That's what I'd like us to think about. And if that were the case, we'd probably end up focusing on quality improvement and continuous quality assurance. So how many of you are engineers in the room? All right, good. So many of you are probably on the policy side uh, uh, as well as on the medical and clinical side. But one of the things that we try to do uh, in the engineering world is continuous quality assurance. It's not about measurement for the sake of measurement. It's not measurement for the sake of compliance or regulatory whatever, but it's measurement to figure out what kind of assurance of quality I'm trying to produce. So what I'd like for us to think about is this idea of continuous quality assurance as the intended goal of what we're gonna be working on uh, over the next couple of days, and not about data collection and quality measurement. That's, that's, that, that's the important part here. 
So let's reimagine this over the next uh, five, 10 minutes. I'd like to talk about reimagining quality improvement and continuous quality uh, assurance for a patient first, digital first quality experience. And I'm just calling that PDQX because we're in Washington, DC. And if you don't invent a acronym uh, up on stage, you're considered a failure. And at least I've done my job for today. So I've got an acronym. We're all going to remember PDQX. So let's reimagine it uh, with uh, this particular approach. Uh, so there is a way of, of building things uh, on top of each other. But let's imagine if we just started from scratch. What would we do if we all got the chance of saying, well, I, I, don't, I don't have to worry about any history or any legacy. I can just go from scratch. What would that particularly look like? So if we start from scratch, I want us to think about what uh, Seema Verma, uh, I don't know how many of you saw, uh, how many of you know this meaningful measures concept? Anybody heard about this, right? This is less than a week old. So uh, we've got, we, we have uh, um, uh, the class president here on the right hand side who knows the answer. So uh, I think when you look at what Seema produced here, and this is worth reading, I mean, her speech was uh, uh, much longer. Uh, and it's referenced here, and I'm happy to share this uh, deck with you guys on uh, speakerdeck.com. It'll be up uh, later today. But uh, basically, this, was her, this is her speech. I didn't make any of this up. This is her saying this. Uh, so uh, last week, CMS announced uh, patience over paperwork. How many like that? Right? Patience over paperwork. I, who, who's going to be pushing back on that? To address regulatory burden, effort to go through all of regulations to reduce burden, all good stuff. As you go further, uh, they're talking, she's talking about reviewing the hospital star ratings program and announcing this comprehensive initiative called Meaningful Measures. Now, in the middle, she talks about the fact that it takes a new approach to quality measures to reduce burden of reporting. Now, the burden of reporting is interesting because uh, that burden occurs because many of us, we just agreed, at least in this room, and we're all right, that it was for regulatory purposes, right? So uh, if that is the case, then are we saying somehow that we're removing the regulatory requirements and that's why the burden decreases? Or is it something else? So let's question that uh, a little bit more. Meaningful measures will involve only ass assessing those core issues that are most vital to providing high quality care and improving patient outcomes, she says. All right, so now we have to wonder, what does that mean? How, how do you know that you've improved patient outcomes? We'll talk about that uh, a little bit as well. Now she goes on to say it's better to focus on achieving results as opposed to having CMS try to micromanage and measure processes. That's very interesting, right? We're all most of what we do in our day-to-day -day quality world is process measures. We all would love to do outcomes measures, so I think uh, uh, she's saying all the right things there. And then if we do that, it helps with two things. It helps make sure that we have high impact measurement areas that safeguard public health, very, very important. And the second thing, promote a more focused quality measures development towards outcomes. And my favorite part is right here, patients, families, and their providers. Now this is all big deal. This is only a few days old, right? But it's important to say, as we're starting to reimagine this, what support do we have from regulators? What support do we have from CMS? And I'm not sure you can get any higher than this right now. So we've got a lot, support, a lot of support for what we're going to talk about. Uh, so this was just published literally on Monday, so uh, uh, very new. So my suggestion is let's look at the PDQX measures and three key areas. If we reimagine this and said, OK, there, none of this exists today, how would we proceed? What would be our? Uh, uh, guardrails, uh, uh, what would be our first principles? Number one, I'd say our first principle should be any measure, then something that somebody asks us to do that is not understandable by patients or their families does not get uh, any attention whatsoever. Okay, now what does that mean? That, does that mean that we skip process measures that we don't care? No, that doesn't mean that. What it means is if the focus is outcomes and the focus is patients and their caregivers, then that's our target, and everything works back from there. Process measurements aren't useless. They're just not useful as much as outcomes measures are. And so when we say that they must be understandable by patients and caregivers, and to me, it's even uh, that caregivers part isn't uh, just a throw uh, line that was thrown in. I think it's very important that these numbers that we're calculating, the measures that we're collecting, must be tied to the caregivers, family members, uh, et cetera, because a lot of times they're doing the work of understanding what's going on with our particular care. The second thing, it's got to be outcomes focused and not process centric. I think there's not, not, not going to be a whole lot of people that disagree with that. And what I'd like to say is in the future, if we add any new measures, we've got to figure out how to remove older ones. 
because the further down you go uh, with more and more measures, the worse things get. So if you go and add another measure, could it be a superset of a measure? And that means that we're going to eliminate one by producing another. So if we believe that these guardrails are uh, useful, let me now ask you guys uh, uh, some, some questions here going forward. Now, how would we actually pull this off? So uh, if you look at the, if you look at, uh, the patient uh, focused, digital first, patient first uh, areas, how do we actually create and know what matters most to patients? How many of you have heard of PROMS, P-R-O-M-S, right? Patient, record, uh, patient reported uh, outcomes measures. So uh, patient reported outcomes measures are validated in order to help us understand what our patients care most about. So what's interesting is that uh, just last week, uh, there, was a, there was a conference that took place where it was focused on uh, value. It's a global conference focused on how to achieve value in healthcare. And there were a number of conversations during the day focused on quality measures. And there were many people that came in and talked about the fact that they are finding PROMs very successful in their day-to-day -day ability to get input from patients about what they feel their outcomes look like. Now, um, when, we, when we say uh, PROMs, what we are talking about, again, these are, not, uh, these are not soft measures. I'm not asking a patient, how do you feel today? And I'm leaving it at that. I mean, these are validated questions that are in, uh, asked in a very methodical, predictable manner that then we can apply things like CQL and, and our other uh, in, integration efforts uh, too. So uh, patients don't really have a voice today in quality measures. And so if we were doing this from the ground up, if we we're reimagining, how would we bring them into the feedback loop? Proms might be a great way to do that. Second, who determines whether something is an outcomes focus or a process focus? Again, the proms guys are doing a reasonably good job there. So if we say we're reimagining and we start from the bottom up, that might be a great direction to look at. And the last one is, how do we know if somebody is using an old measure when we want to try to eliminate it? So what we need to do here is put in telemetry and continuous learning to figure out who's actually using these measures uh, for patient care and institutional processes rather than regulatory and compliance purposes. So that doesn't mean we're going to throw any of those uh, away anytime soon, but if we're reimagining it, that's what things would look like. So uh, how many of you have been to healthmeasures.net? Anybody? No? What the digital quality? Can you raise your hand high, like higher? One few, okay, so everybody who has a laptop open, go to healthmeasures.net, right? Because uh, what you'll see here is that the NIH has been working on uh, P-R-O-M-I-S, promise, it, uh, without the E at the end, uh, and the uh, neuro uh, QOL, ask you me, these are all patient-centric, patient-focused, patient-reported uh, style of outcomes measures. And if we're not studying this, and this is the Digital Quality Summit, we've got a major problem because that means we're all institutionally focused and not patient focused in this case. And in a reimagined world, we cannot be focused on uh, us as much as we are about our patients. So if you go to the homepage, just what you'll see here, Promise is on here. What you'll see is that uh, on the case for Promise, what's interesting is that, again, these are not uh, uh, generic uh, kind of questions. They're, they're condition specific and they are uh, adult uh, as well as pediatric uh, versions of the same thing. Physical health, mental health, social health. And the idea is that there are profile domains and uh, additional domains that they're helping with already. And what I'm wondering is, as we start to look over the next day and a half in our workshops, where are the things that we are talking about that we can say, well, why are we looking at this institutionally focused? Why don't we just switch to the patient focus? When two are equal and they take the equal amount of work, and we're going to go do things with them, how do we move to that one? Uh, how do we move to the patient side one instead of our institutionally focused one is what I'd like for you guys to think about. This was the conference I was mentioning last week, and I've circled that bottom piece because this is, it was, it, they were brought together about global progress on the value agenda. How, how well is value-based care, uh, not, not in the way the American, that we as Americans define it, but generally how do you, how do you calculate value for care that means that, that folks have, are starting to look at and compute what value means in terms of quality associated with how patients and their caregivers feel about it. Now, this is a big deal 
It's very different from what we've been doing for decades, which, we, which is very institutionally focused, regulatory focused, compliance focused. Now, when you look at this, there's a couple of uh, presentations done last week uh, that really is talk, are talking about the specifics. If you have time between today and tomorrow, take, take a peek at these, because both at Partners uh, here in the US and over at Exeter, both of these uh, teams talked about the very specific ways that uh, patient reported outcomes measures or PROMs are helping. Like one cool example that they gave was that a, a, a statement was made that PROMs helps improve um, the outcomes for uh, oncology treatments. Now, just by itself, it's, a hard, it's hard to believe uh, that just, you know, if you just switch to patient reported outcomes measures, all of a sudden uh, the oncology outcomes would be improved. But the rationale for that is that the patient reported outcomes measures, one of the patients, uh, one of the reported outcomes measure is, are you currently depressed? Well, if you see somebody is depressed and that's the outcome measure, you're likely to go do something about it. If it's a compliance measure or if it's for regulatory reasons, you don't actually do anything about it, right? So in these cases, what we've noticed is that PROMs help you go do something about the things, make them a little bit more actionable. This is an example of what uh, some of the PROMs look like. And uh, one of the earliest uh, works here is by Valderis uh, back in 2008. So uh, it, it, as we start to look at over the next day and a half, what our workshops look like, what our measures look like, how are we going to calculate, how are we going to put in fire, how are we going to use it in CQL, could we start to incorporate PROMs into what we're doing today? That's what I'm challenging us uh, uh, to, to really think about. And when you look at this, you can see it incorporates biological symptom statuses, functional statuses, general health perceptions. It's the stuff on the right, health-related quality of life. That's the stuff that really starts to move institutions in a particular direction when they start to incorporate that and make that part of their day-to-day uh, -day workflow and, and associated work. So what I'd like us to start thinking about, and, and I'm going to ask you guys what you think here, just uh, you know, jump in and, and see what you think, is uh, we, what, what, and what all this means is if we're going to go to patient-reported focus and if we're going to focus on outcomes ra rather than uh, process measures, it means, number one, we have to move from opacity to transparency. Now, that, the good news is that's why we're all here. So when I talk to uh, senior leaders in, in government as well as in uh, health systems and payer organizations, uh, what, we, what we mean to them is everybody has to see these numbers as they are collected and in real time. Transparency is not easy. It takes a lot of work, but it should be a senior executive level goal. If quality measures are not uh, transparent in any organization, it means that leadership is pretty bad. That's how we have to uh, see that. Second is that it, we have to move from it being reportable to actually being actionable. That means that as a measure is calculated and made transparent, someone somewhere in the care pathway can do something about it to create an instant feedback for immediate interventions. Like, how many of you are buying any of this? You like it? All right, so yeah, if you guys, if you push back, if you don't, uh, uh, if you don't agree on something. Next is that we are currently mostly consensus driven and we have to move to data driven. Now this seems like one of those uh, obvious things, but very important. Did you have a question? Yeah. Go for it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I, no, that's a great question. And uh, in, in this particular case, I am by no means saying that we introduce PROMs and eliminate everything else. However, what I am saying is that if you target the PROMs as the uh, overall target for transparency, et cetera, then in order to achieve the PROM, there's 100 things you'll have to do in advance that you'll now do in order of operations better. So for example, what, you know, like, uh, how many of you know the uh, Toyota uh, quality system? Some of you, right? That, the idea there is you make this transparent, everyone gets to see it, and you target the highest level or the most uh, actionable uh, measurement first, which then forces everybody down the path early on to collect whatever they need 
to achieve that particular outcome. So it is by, it, it's, it's crazy to say that we are not going to have process measures. I mean, without process measures, you cannot achieve your outcome measures. However, what management needs to be targeted on, what management and uh, staff uh, as, is measured on as far as what they can be paid for or uh, what their performance is going to be, uh, the more we target those to, through patient reported outcomes measures and the bigger that those outcomes measures are, the less we're focused on process uh, across the system. The, anybody who has to achieve those outcomes has to roll back and figure out what they need to do. That's why it's really important. So by, by no means am I saying that process measures, et cetera, are going to be eliminated at, at all. But if we don't go on first principles, like what is our target, we're not going to get it right to, uh, as we go along. So as I mentioned, uh, moving from uh, consensus-driven to data-driven, this is one of, you know, one of my uh, uh, doctor friends taught me eminence-driven versus evidence-driven. How many of you have heard this before? All right. So eminence means it's how important you are, what school you went to, where you were trained, rather than the actual evidence, right? And so when you look at uh, process measures, you accidentally end up uh, away from evidence because you'll end up saying, well, at Harvard we learned so-and-so, or at Mayo Clinic this was done that way, and that becomes the measure that we're all going after, rather than the continuous feedback that we get from big data, from the idea that the more data that we have today, uh, the more value we have in the evidence that's being produced continuously. We're not waiting, like Chuck said this morning, 17 years before figuring out whether or not we should change our behavior. If we have to wait 17 years to change our behavior, that ain't much of a learning system. That ain't much of a uh, feedback uh, loop. It's got to be instantaneous. It's got to be uh, immediate. We've got to move from compliance to value, right? This one is actually pretty straightforward. Uh, and, and what I mean by value could be something as simple as patient safety. It doesn't have to be something more, uh, 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 more grand than that uh, at all. Moving from analog to digital, this one is pretty obvious. But there, this, this is where we have to start to say, are the measures that cannot be automatically collected worth collecting at all? So my rule is, if you have to hand enter it, it's a crappy measure. How many of you believe that? And anybody not raising their hand, well, why are you not raising your hand? Right? So he, here, it, what we end up just doing is, we think a measure is useful. We have no way of automatically collecting it. We think a measure is useful. And then we toss it onto the clerics known as MDs and hope that they're going to find a way to collect it all, give that to us, and then we'll be vindicated because we thought it was a great measure. Right? So these new clerical staff that we happen to be creating uh, are wasting their time. If I mean, this has to be a simple rule. If you cannot auto-collect it from a system somehow, it is a horrible measure, should not even be thought about, and we need to push it to the side in favor, hopefully, of some outcomes reported measure. The system generated one, the more we can move to patient self-service, the more we are getting things from IoT, medical devices, EHRs, patient generated healthcare data, those are how we need to start shifting our thoughts. So if somebody suggests a new measure, you're talking about this over the next day and a half, it has to be asked, what is the ability for it to be system generated? And if it's not system generatable, why the heck are we talking about it in 2017? It's gotta be that, you have to push back that hard. Now, the other problem is, is that any measures are, that are discrete, point in time, are problematic. We've got to figure out how do we switch from discrete measures that are being done point in time to continuous ones, because otherwise it's not really a, uh, uh, an instant uh, and immediate feedback capable. The next thing is from retrospective reporting to intellect, uh, interactive telemetry. Now, today, for example, uh, in the discussion around CQL, the idea is there is now a uh, standard um, query language designed for seeing through complex event processing and through other means, there are streams of data being created. How do we make sure that that interactive telemetry gives us the, uh, re uh, the measures that we need rather than doing it through retrospective reporting? This is another view of what I was mentioning a minute ago, which was uh, if it's, it's hand-entered, it's a crappy measure. If, it's for, if you're getting it from retrospective reporting, it's probably a crappy measure as well, even though it's system generated. So we have to think about that interactive telemetry. This is probably our central problem at this, mo uh, at this time is we all like to talk about patient centricity, but we're all mostly institutionally centric. Like I, I, if I work for a health insurer, if I work for a, a health system, et cetera, I think about what's good for me as the institution, 
not truly the patient. How do we know that's the case? Well, because very rarely do we actually talk about the multiple stakeholder, multiple institution problem. If we are patient-centric, it means we gather all of our partners together, all of our supply chain and everything else, and work on what measures look like across multiple institutions. And if you are not working across multiple institutions, you are not patient-centric. Stop saying it. Stop fooling yourself because we, start, we make ourselves feel good to say, oh yeah, I'm being patient-centric, I care a lot about my patients, but the moment they walk out your door, it doesn't matter. The moment that uh, they've se uh, stepped out of your system, it doesn't matter. That is not patient centricity. Patient centricity means you help with multiple stakeholder, multiple institution type problems. We are moving toward, uh, we've got a lot of capabilities to do population based, not a whole lot to be personalized. That means that today measures are very rarely personalized. Like we know that the measures that we need uh, are, are more likely uh, to be more superior if they're tied specifically to children, specifically to women, specifically to men, specifically to older women, or women of a particular age group, or men of a particular age group. These measures are, I mean, the, the more uh, granular they are, the more likely that they're gonna have value, but it's so hard because they're not system generated. We use the MD clerics to do all the work, so how much are we gonna keep asking them to do? So we end up being more and more population-based, and again, we make ourselves feel good because, hey, uh, you know, we're, by looking at this at the population, we're able to take care of all these people, but populations are never dealt with as a population. Every single one of us is a human being. Uh, how we react to certain kinds of treatments and conditions, et cetera, is very, very different, and it's very important to get to personalized care. Now, this is a, the, the problem um, of the sector-specific uh, measures is, getting, is growing. So we've got uh, meaningful use, HEDIS, STARS, MIPS, MACRA, 21st Century Cures, and we'll invent two more while we're here over the next day and a half. <laughs> but we're going to be very productive about it. We're going to have a whole new group of measures here. But what we've got to figure out is how do we eliminate for unification? And of course, you're going to look at me and say, Shahid, you know, health insurers need different measures and providers need different measures, et cetera. But that's true if we're institutionally focused. It is not true if you're patient focused, right? Because if the, if the target is a PROM, which is a patient reported outcome measure, then there has to be a way for us to unify these to be meaningful to that patient and then roll it back to our institutions. And ultimately what we're trying to get to here is the measurement which leads to process improvement. I mean, there's no, uh, I, I, I'm an engineer. I believe in process improvement. Uh, it's very, very important. But I do it for some reason that I'm trying to assure something. So here, what are we talking about? What we're trying to ensure is that we are assuring for care across the multiple institutions and multiple providers that we're working with. I mean, it's the, it's the essence of what we're trying to do. So if somebody says, well, why are you collecting this measure? Why did you create uh, this uh, measurement at all? It has to be because we're trying to do some care management capability for our patients. It could be prevention or anything else, but we're trying to assure something, and that's what our uh, purpose has to be. So back to reality, right? So we took a took a half hour to, to talk about what the, what the future looks like. And now I'd like for you know, uh, jump up and uh, uh, do, do ask questions. I want I wanna you guys to comment on what you heard here. Is it crazy? Uh, you know, do you agree with parts of it? Uh, do you agree with none of it? Let's, let's talk about that. And I'm glad that Keith came up first. Uh, so uh, I'll catch up with this right after Keith's done. So um, it, it's, it's great to be recognized. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, so my question has to do with measure complexity. Um, we, I, I've seen hundreds of measures. And one of the things that I think uh, frustrates me the most in measure uh, criteria is exceptions and exclusions, because that's where all of the gunge is. That's where all of the gory try to clean this measure up so that it looks good when I report the number. Um, and, and so the question in my mind is, 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 is when you're looking at a measure, you're actually looking to see how good you're getting. You're, you're looking to see how uh, things are going. Um, you're not necessarily looking for 100%. Your max might be 80 or 90%. The best that you can do might not be everything. 
So I'm wondering if anybody's done any looking into what is the value add that putting in all of these exceptions and exclusions and everything else uh, into the measure, and what's the percentage improvement in the measure itself and what the value of the measure is for dealing with all of these exceptional cases? So for example, in the, in the uh, pneumococcal vaccination measure that we were looking at just a few minutes ago, right? It's very simple. For patients over 65, did they get this vaccination within one year of that vaccination? Really simple. Until you get into, except for the patients that are immunocompromised, for whom we need to apply a different measure to, except for we don't apply a different measure, we just actually score the measure differently for those patients. So has anybody done any looking at how sort of taking that sort of different approach to all of the exceptions, exclusions, uh, uh, and, and maybe trying to eliminate some of that complexity and therefore also reduce the cost of implementing Yeah, and that's a great question. And so Keith, of course, is uh, from uh, GE, so this is not an esoteric question for him. They have to build systems that can compute these measures. So it's very, very important uh, to answer this question. This goes back to that point that I was making that we are looking at populations and not people, uh, not individuals. So personalizing it, the reason why we have so many exclusions, et cetera, is most of our measures are not necessarily condition specific and they're certainly not personalized. So inclu inclu exclusions and exceptions are necessary primarily because of, of, of us dealing at the population level. Now, one of the ways that uh, we've seen both the EHR world as well as our um, health institutions, and by the way, if anybody else has a comment to uh, Keith's question to answer it uh, more precisely, jump up and, and let me know. And if you have other questions, please do come on up. But one of the ways that we're seeing this uh, computed uh, is going down to more specific cohorts. So instead of dealing with population, you're saying in these particular, like the, that exclusion and that exception that was required in, that, in your example, gave a condition exclusion that if a person has a specific condition, you don't run these particular measures on them because it doesn't make sense to do so. So if we roll this back and said, well, if we turn this into a PROM somehow, meaning a patient reported outcome measure, the patient reported outcome measure would be, have you had the flu in the last 10 years? If you have not had the flu in the last 10 years, should you even be getting a flu shot over the next five years? That's not, I'm not saying I have the answer to that, but those are the kind of questions that you can ask when you have big data, data rolling in, and now you're not just giving uh, things that we think. So the idea that everyone should get a flu shot might be an eminence-based decision made many years ago without somebody second-guessing it. And now we have enough data, should we start second-guessing it? And second-guessing not in a bad way, but in a good way, evidence-driven second-guessing. So I think, you know, to Keith's question, I think it's very important to say that the exceptions and exclusions are necessary because we're dealing at populations, but that can be fixed if we go to more personalized. A comment on Keith or a new question? Yeah, since you give me an opening to comment, uh, just to add to the conversation, just my two cents. I, I think uh, <clears throat> the, the exceptions and exclusions, um, especially for the numerator that uh, Keith is referring to, uh, is definitely the, the sort of hardest piece of it to handle, especially in eCQMs. It's, it's sort of a little bit easier, but it's still hard even in a general medical record because the issue there is um, um, clinical documentation improvement. You know, please write it somewhere that you did something right. or, or that you chose not to do something. Right. But for, when you for have compliance to, purposes, you mean? Well, so, so here's the issue uh, in the question he's raising is that is there a statistical way to somehow ignore the exceptions that you should have done something, but you chose not to because there was an allergy, that because there was a contraindication, and so forth. So, um, by, by the way, it, it actually is, uh, is uh, isolated to the process measures mostly. It's not as applicable in the outcomes measures. Right. And it's usually where you get a, um, where you have done the numerator, that's fine, but when you get, let's say, a 20% denominator only, then the question is, is it because you didn't do it? or is it because you didn't do it for a reason? Right. And 
I'm not sure if there is a statistical way to get around it. Perhaps there is. Um, but uh, certainly some way to um, perhaps supplement a pure ECQM with some kind of partial abstraction or something might be helpful there. Mm -hmm. And so I think, um, you know, I'm not saying that it couldn't be done statistically. I'm just simply saying that it would be hard to say that the 20% that are currently denominator only where basically you're being dinged, how many of those you can carve out um, because there was a good reason for not doing it. So just, just to follow up on that um, particular statement, so, the, 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 so there's a research project that's involved in getting at uh, the answer to some of this question. Uh, because you're right, there, there are some cases where, you know, if, if A, then B, uh, unless B is otherwise, you know, uh, not medically appropriate, Right, and that's where uh, some of those exceptions, exclusions come from. It strikes me that we don't know enough about uh, the ratios of populations for where if A then B uh, versus uh, when B would be appropriate except for, for some other reason when it's not medically appropriate. What's that ratio? Because if you're talking about 1% of the patients for whom this intervention's not medically appropriate. Putting all of that extra work into um, giving that out for providers for that one percent doesn't seem to add the right value. That that's, I guess, the key point. Yeah, and it's a great point. And I think just to, just to put a little pin on that, uh, if we move to system-generated data, I think we'll be able to make this argument that uh, um, that the the more system-generated data we use, and only do we use system-generated data when doing uh, quality measures, it will help us with having more data that we can do these computations on. N next question. Yeah, just following up on, on, on Keith's uh, comment. So here, here, your, here is your answer. And there are staff from NCQA here, so they should be able to, <laughs> to help you out. Any NCQA <coughs> people here? Yes. Any, <laughs> any of the traditional hybrid NCQA HEDIS measures in the old data submission tool before they switched to an IDSS had tabulated the number of contraindications, the number of exclusions. So just go back to that historically, and that'll give you, at least for some measures and some conditions, a general idea of the prevalence of contraindications, exclusions, et cetera. The challenge is you can only do that with a painfully calculated manual chart review. That's yeah. the pain. Which means we should eliminate it. <laughs> yep. I, I, I think, look, so we just all take shit for a living. Let's stop doing it. <laughs> stop doing it. If we all just said we're not doing it anymore, what are they going to do? Fire us all? Only if one or two of us are screaming up there like crazy people like me, I'm alone. I don't want to be alone. I want to say let's stop doing crazy stuff because if we keep doing it, people keep expecting uh, for us to do it. Like MDs who are actually uh, doing clerical work, if you just continue to do clerical work, you'll be called the cleric. If you just stop and there's enough people behind it, I think we can actually make this uh, move. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, uh, just uh, to follow up on Keith a little bit further for it, you know, Keith, I think you're both right and I also think you're wrong, which is I, computers are really, really good at dealing with complexity fast and efficiently and with 100% accuracy for that. No, no, that's, that's where I think the problem is and that's why I think you're right too, which is, when we have exclusions and exceptions and all these other criteria that are based upon a manual process that isn't part of the care byproduct, the, the data that just comes out of the visit, that's where we run into the problem for it. And we need to be able to figure out and discern which parts of it are a documentation burden. And anything that I actually, Shahid, I think that your point is right. Anything that we have to do manually is, is not a good process. Mm -hmm. yep. and, and the logic doesn't necessarily Right. Yep. Yeah, I agree. Okay, uh, so uh, other questions? Please bring them on up. Uh, uh, otherwise, I'll start to summarize. I've got about five minutes left. Go ahead. Okay, um, well, I just want to say we just spent a fair amount of time getting really into the weeds on the current way we do measurement. But you just challenged us to change the way we do measurement. Yeah, that's to what I'm going to To make it patient-centric. Yes. Right? And that's a whole other thing. 
that means we're actually missing a good percentage of the data we need that's in other EHR products or in other clinics or in other hospitals yeah. or dare I say other community mental health centers or social service agencies that are necessary for measures. That's right. And so rather than quibbling about the, the mechanics of the current process, maybe we should think about how we get patient-centered. No, I totally agree. That, that we only quibbled about it because we said back to reality. That's why. But now we're going to go uh, talk about does the simple act of measurement in, improve quality? I think in general, most of us would agree that if you're not measuring, you're not going to get anywhere. In this case, so the argument that we're making is if we all don't stand up and say, I'm going to say no to two things. If it's manually generated, I don't want to talk about it. And if it's not designed for patient reportable and understandable measures, I'm not going to talk about it. That's the two things that I'm challenging us to do. That means whether it's NCQA, it's HL7, it's CMS, anybody brings up a topic that is not one of those two things, we have to say 20% of our business, 50% of our business, 70% of our, whatever that is, we have to stand up and push back. Because if we keep saying yes, guess what's happening? This is not going to change next year, and it's not going to change two years from now, it's not going to change three years from now. You keep doing crazy stuff today, we'll just automate the craziness tomorrow, and then so you'll just do stupid things, but just much, much faster. That's all we're going to get over the next few years. That's what we keep doing. Let's stop doing stupid stuff, and one way to make sure that that is, if somebody talks about a measure, and they cannot explain why it matters to a patient, we say, stop. We're not doing it. We, we have a lot of baggage that we have to handle, but we don't have to go beyond that. Second question is, does increasing measurement transparency yield higher quality? I think here that might also be somewhat true. If I can open the, the small number of measures I'm doing for patient reported outcomes and open them widely, does that help increase the quality? If I say I'm going to eliminate new measures, I'm going to eliminate old measures before I put up new ones. I think that's probably true as well. So let's take this as a, as a call to action here. We've got SEMA, who basically said two important things, patients over paperwork and meaningful measures. Let's hold us, our, all ourselves, as well as our government and uh, senior leadership to task, and that is, if it's patients over paperwork, the hell are we doing measuring more and more process quality? Well, it's going to be seen as a necessity. Well, why is it a necessity? Where is the necessity leading towards? What's the objective? What's the key result? What is the success metric as a patient can see it? And meaningful measures, Seema herself, in her speech, it's up on CMS.gov, says that we're going to do the things that matter most to patients and their families. So if somebody pushes back on you, you say, not crazy Shahid said it up here, but <laughs> Seema said it. Patients and their families, the stuff that matters to them is what we're going to focus on. So just in summary, let's reimagine drastically reducing what we uh, measure in three areas. Must be understandable by patients and caregivers, and if not, throw it out. Don't talk about it. Don't take it uh, as in the next conversation. It must be outcomes focused and not process centric. If, it, if a measure isn't demonstrating outcomes easily understood by patients or loved ones, ignore it. So you don't have to do all of it. This is, this is the important part. We are in a democracy. We've learned in the last year one thing. Laws aren't as unbreakable as we thought they were. <laughs> Not at all, right? So that means that every new measure must eliminate an older measure. And this is actually part of the Trump administration's OMB environment where they've been, you know, the rule is if you introduce a new regulation, you have to get rid of two old ones. So again, I'm giving you stuff that is already uh, part of what uh, the uh, government is focused on. So I hope you enjoyed this, uh, um, you know, get, get this uh, going a little bit. Uh, you, my email is down there and my Twitter address is uh, up there as well. Uh, this presentation will be up at uh, speakerdeck.com slash Shah. That's where I put all my uh, decks uh, from before as well. So any, do we, I think we have a minute or two. We have, right? Uh, two, two, yeah, we have one or two more questions. Anybody want to throw in? Anybody disagree with me? I just love one person to come up and say that I'm full of crap. <laughs> that would be a good conversation, right? Uh, we got a taker. You gonna tell me I'm full of crap? No, no. Ah. I, I, I think one more thing we must uh, uh, really uh, care about are the leading indicators of measures. We don't, we don't measure the leading indicators. Like uh, a five pound weight increase in a week is a leading indicator for a readmission 
for a CHF, can we measure weights of patients every week and can we have the infrastructure to do that? So we don't invest in leading indicators much and I think that's one thing we must focus on. Yeah, I love that. And in fact, the way you can do leading measures is, so the outcome measure from a patient reported pr perspective with me, as a patient, I do not want to go to the hospital. As a patient, I don't want to go to the doctor. That's my outcome, that's what I want. How do I do that? Well, if I'm personalized, that means that me, uh, as a male, for me not to end up in the hospital or to go to the doctor twice a year, here are the things that I must get done. And then all of our work should be associated on me, focused on what I care about. But we don't actually ask patients, what do you want to happen? We don't actually care about uh, the patients. And not, not because we as humans don't care, it's just we're not institutionally set up for it. It's really hard. I mean, the stuff that I'm talking about here sounds very easy. It's not. I mean, it's really, really hard. But it can only get slightly easier if we target what our outcome is from a patient side. And I think that's, that's the point that I've been making. So I think I'm out of time now. Great. Thank you.